pleasure to be here this afternoon. This has to be the first time that anybody other than myself has gotten academic credit for anything I've done. So um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here. And um, thanks, for, thanks for the introduction and thanks for coming out this afternoon. Um, just a few words about myself before I dive into the subject matter of today's presentation. Um, I live in Tel Aviv and today I'm an attorney in private practice in Israel with a firm called Herzog Fox and Neman. We used to brand ourselves as Israel's largest law firm, but recently we were overtaken by our number two competitors, so we're now rebranding as Israel's leading law firm. <laughs> and I work for the commercial department of our firm, uh, but that's not the reason I'm here today. The reason I'm here today is that for eight years prior to joining HFM, I was an attorney with the Israel Defense Forces Military Advocate General's Corps, which is our version of the U.S. JAG Corps that some of you may be familiar with. And I hope, um, I, I was released from the court at the rank of major after eight years of service. And I'm a graduate of Hebrew University in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv University uh, Law Schools. And I hope to draw on my experiences with the IDF MAG Corp um, to talk about the shifting paradigms of international law in counterterrorism operations post 9 11 through the Israeli experience of dealing with Palestinian terrorism in our neighborhood. Just by way of background, I would say that under Israeli law and IDF standing orders, the Military Advocate General's Corps, to which I belong, holds two primary responsibilities. The first responsibility is for law enforcement within the IDF. And like the JAG Corps, the IDF MAG Corps is responsible for initiating investigations in cases of misconduct by soldiers, either criminal or on the battlefield, for prosecuting soldiers who are, or troops who have broken the law and, and for pursuing the enforcement of law within the military. Uh, a subsection of that, which is unique to the Israeli situation, is that because Israel administers what we call the Palestinian occupied territories, and today just the West Bank, under the Geneva, the Fourth Geneva Convention, Israel is required to take responsibility for the enforcement of the law within the occupied territories as well. So the IDF MAG Corps is also responsible for prosecution of offenders within the West Bank. And my first role in the court was as a military prosecutor in the West Bank. Um, the second important function which the IDF legal court fills, and that's going to be the focus of my presentation today, is to serve as legal advisor to the IDF on all issues pertaining to the legality of the IDF's operations. And the <coughs> IDF MAG Corps, like the, the US JAG Corps, is very deeply integrated into the decision-making process of the IDF. And I'll talk about the reasons why that is a bit later on. But um, we, we serve as the final legal advisor to the IDF on all issues that have to do with the law. Um, during the years that I was, excuse me, during the years that I was with the IDF, my responsibilities in the court varied from, as I said, uh, serving as a military prosecutor to advising the IDF on matters of international strategic cooperation representing the IDF in its contacts and negotiations with international organizations, peacekeeping forces in the United Nations, and advising on matters of diplomatic and consular law and maritime and airspace law. But those are, none of those are the reason why I'm here today. The reason I'm here today is that for three years, I served as the mysteriously dubbed head of security section in the IDF's international law department, where I was responsible for coordinating all of the IDF's legal advisory capacities on operational law, which is the law that governs the activities of armed forces on the battlefield. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, before I start talking about the substance of my presentation, I, I really should make two reservations or, or, or mention two caveats. The first is, and this is relevant because we're in, ac in an academic setting now, is that I'm not an international law expert in the sort of traditional sense of the word. I'm, I'm not an academic. Um, I've never been an academic. If you Google my name, you won't find any um, academic literature with my name on it, though you will find that I mentioned in the Goldstone Report. Um, I think it's footnote 301, for those of you who are interested. Um, but I'm, I'm not an academic, uh, and I'm not published, and, and so when you come to speak to a university, it's appropriate to make that reservation. Um, that having been said, those of you who are familiar with international law and with Israel's situation will probably agree that the Middle East is sort of a hothouse for international law. And, and as such, um, I hope that the practical experience I had in applying international law to IDF operations, which is something you won't find in any international law textbook, will have some relevant value um, for yourself as, as legal practitioners and students. Um, the second reservation I should make is that 
for two years now I've been in private practice. I'm, not, I'm no longer a civil servant with the Israeli government. And as such, my perspective on the issues that I'm going to talk about may have changed over time. And I'm, I'm no longer in the sort of front seat of the car. I'm now more of a back seat driver. And obviously, that gives me some different perspective and also some distance from the issues that I'll be talking about. And so if there are any sort of topical questions that come up that have to do with occurrences from the last months, I hope I can address those at the end. But I may not be as, as involved in, in recent occurrences as I once was in the past. To give you some chronological context for the presentation I'd like to make, I mean, we all know that Sunday was 10 years to the 9-11 attacks. And I'm sure everybody sitting in this room had a moment on Sunday to reflect on where they were, what they were doing when those terrible events occurred. And I, I certainly did um, myself. And I joined the IDF legal court just a few months after 9-11-2001 in the height of what we called Operation Defensive Shield, which was the first large-scale military campaign the IDF was involved in post 9-11 against Palestinian terrorism in the West Bank. Um, I was released from the IDF at the end of 2009, just a year after Operation Cast Lead, which was the operation the IDF conducted against terrorists, Hamas terrorism in the Gaza Strip in early 2009. In the interim, I was involved in the Second Lebanon War, which took place in 2006, and also in the implementation of the disengagement uh, program in 2005. So that sort of gives you a bit of um, temporal context for, for my presentation today. And while the immediate catalyst for my visit here in the United States are the occurrences anticipated in the United Nations later this month, I, I don't want to talk about that right now. We can come back to that later um, if you like. But I'd like to try to talk a little bit about the role international law has in shaping the conduct of forces on the battlefield and the way um, Western democracies wage war on terrorism. And try to see in the context of the last decade how that has changed and how international law has responded to the changing nature of terrorism. And before, before I sort of dive into that, I think one more reservation is appropriate, and that is that regardless of whatever I say today and whatever the international law textbooks will tell you, whatever academic literature you've read, it's, it's fair to say that international law doesn't operate in isolation on the international legal arena. And that regardless of what the legal situation is, there will always be other powerful forces at play in the international legal arena that have a very significant impact on the dynamic of international relations. And those obviously include <coughs> politics and diplomacy and public opinion and the media and so on and so forth. And so any conversation on the impact of international law on international affairs always has to be conducted taking into account the fact that international law doesn't operate in isolation. And that's an important reservation to make before we dive in. And now without any further introduction, I'd like to start by asking a question, and perhaps with that last reservation in mind, asking a question, why is international law so important? And why is international law so relevant to armed forces, to the military? And I, that's a valid question, I think. And, and it may sound like a strange question to ask in a law school. But it's a valid question given the fact that anybody who's been following international affairs in recent years would, would agree that regardless of the law and what, legal, um, what the legal situation is, the dynamic of international affairs is very often influenced by extra-legal considerations. And so a valid question comes up. Why is international law, regardless of its shortcomings, so important in assessing international affairs? And, and why is it so important to Western democracies? And why are we so busy talking about the legal aspects of Israel's operations? I mean, it would seem like a more natural choice to talk about Israel in the context of a political debate of a moral argument, of a sort of legitimacy in the broader, in the broader sense of the word. And, and, and yet, so much of the international debate on Israel focuses on the legality of Israel's operations, but that it sort of begs the question, why is international law so important in assessing Israel's actions? And I think there are several reasons for that, and I'll start with the reasons that are sort of universal and then focus on reasons that are more Israel-specific. The universal reason is that international law, regardless of its shortcomings, is the language of international relations. And it's, it presents a, a set of normative terms that the international community can use to engage on, on various issues on the international arena. 
And so, you know, regardless of its weaknesses, the language the international community uses to speak about international affairs is first and foremost the language of international law. But beyond that, the advantage international law has in shaping international dialogue comes from the fact that international law, in counterdistinction to politics or diplomacy, is objective. And while diplomacy and politics are deeply subjective and, and motivated by interests that are very <coughs> country specific, international law aims to present the international community with an objective standard or benchmark that the international community can use to assess the validity of different occurrences on the international arena. So the advantage that international law presents, the, the opportunity it presents to the international community is that it presents a sort of objective set of norms that the international community can use to assess the legitimacy or illegitimacy of different occurrences. And, and for that reason, I think it remains a very important element of the international debate over international affairs. From a more specific Israeli perspective, though, international law is very important and, and has immediate application to our activities for three central reasons, which I'd like to discuss. The first is, and this may sound obvious to some of you or debatable to others, but Israel is a law-abiding democracy, and the IDF is the military of a law-abiding democracy. And as such, just like all other parts of Israel's public administration, the IDF is subject to the same legal obligations that Israel as a whole is subject to, including Israel's obligations under international law. And as such, the IDF has an inherent obligation as part of Israel's public administration to constantly measure itself up against Israel's legal obligations, including international law. So we've had to internalize that because of the fact that we're part of the public administration of a law-abiding democracy. And just in case that, did, that obligation didn't come from within, it's imposed <coughs> on the IDF through two important mechanisms. One is the enforcement mechanism I talked about before, and the IDF legal court engages in enforcing international law on IDF forces. And in those cases where there are suspicions of troops acting in, in a manner which is inconsistent with Israel's legal obligations, that can be called into question by the IDF's legal court. And there have been many, many, many investigations and indictments for alleged violations of the laws of armed conflict or of international law by IDF troops. I don't say that as a sort of source of pride, but, but only as testament to the fact that even in those cases where troops break the law, that's enforced on the IDF by the legal court. So there's an inherent obligation to upholding the law, which comes with a whip in the form of the enforcement mechanisms through the legal court. And if that weren't enough, the second element that, that uh, merits, merits note is the fact that unlike the judiciaries of most Western democracies, Israel's Supreme Court has been tremendously proactive in applying international law to Israel's security operations. Now, all of you will know that if a human rights organization in the States marches down to the Supreme Court in Washington and files a petition challenging, say, US operations in Afghanistan, the court would never entertain a petition like that. It would, it would find that it's unjusticiable and, and dismiss it on, on the face of things. In Israel, in contrast, our Supreme Court deals with hundreds of petitions per year <coughs> pertaining to the legality of the IDF's military and security operations. In fact, this is not a well-known fact, but more than a third of the petitions heard by Israel's Supreme Court year on year have to do with security-related matters. So our Supreme Court has been tremendously proactive in its involvement in international law. And that obviously <coughs> creates a very interesting dynamic within the Israeli legal community, but also in the broader sense within the IDF, because the IDF has to constantly be cognizant of the fact that the legality of its operations and its decisions could be called into question before the highest court of the land, before the Supreme Court. Now, as opposed to the enforcement mechanism I mentioned before, the Supreme Court's involvement in upholding international law is very often um, ex ante, not ex post. And, and, and often, the Supreme Court will on a sort of emergency petition, will examine the legality of IDF operations as they are occurring. And I remember personally countless incidents where the I, where IDF commanders were called into the Supreme Court to testify about 
the decision making process that was in, you know connected to a specific military operation and why things had to be conducted in one way rather than another. So the, the Supreme Court has a very active role in shaping the IDF's decision making process. And, and that obviously in, helps the IDF internalize its obligations under international law because those are imposed on the IDF by our Supreme Court. Just to give you a sort of flavor of the issues our Supreme Court has dealt with in the context of, of the Palestinian um, arena, the court has dealt with issues such as targeted killings or extrajudicial killings, as they're called here in the United States. And just to sort of give you the, the comparative sense, can you imagine the US Supreme Court dealing with the legality of the CIA's drone attacks in, in Afghanistan? It's, it's, it's hard to comprehend. But our Supreme Court ruled on that issue um, just a couple of years ago. <coughs> Uh, other examples include the legality of the security barrier, or wall, or fence, or whatever name um, you prefer, erected by Israel in the West Bank. And you'll, you'll, you may know that our court examined the barrier mile by mile, and literally instructed the IDF to, to move the fence or the barrier um, east or west, up or down, in specific locations, so that the root of the barrier would eventually comply with international law. The use of artillery in the Gaza Strip. And again, try to imagine the US Supreme Court asking whether the US Army is allowed to use artillery shells on the battlefield. It's, it's, it's unthinkable in Western terms, but our Supreme Court dealt with that issue. The use of ultrasonic booms, the deportation of terrorist suspects, the detention of terrorist suspects. That's actually an example where the US Supreme Court has become involved. Um, economic measures imposed by Israel on the Gaza Strip the legality of the disengagement program. There are countless examples on major issues of military importance where our Supreme Court has become involved in applying international law. You're, those of you who are applying for credit should have gotten a copy of one of the landmark Supreme Court decisions in the Ajuri case, which I'll come back to later on. But if you flip through that, you'll find that our Supreme Court really conducts a very in-depth examination of international law and its applicability to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, affairs. Just to sort of give you an example of how the involvement of the Supreme Court shapes the dynamic of the application of international law by the IDF. An interesting example has to do with the IDF's policy of investigating alleged misconduct by soldiers on the battlefield. There was a petition filed on that issue back in 2003, which the court ruled on just several months ago in 2011. So the court had that case pending for eight long years. And during that time, the court held several hearings where it engaged both the IDF and the NGOs and human rights organizations on the issue and helped the IDF shape a policy which would be acceptable to, you know, under international legal norms and, and really had an impact on the way the IDF dealt with that issue. And this is important to note because unlike in this country, where typically the Supreme Court will hear a case and then come back with a ruling, our Supreme Court really goes down into the field and becomes involved in shaping the policy, not just in adjudicating the policy. And so the fact that the case took eight years and involved several hearings was, you know, it was sort of a back and forth between the court and the IDF where they'd, they'd comment, we'd come back with a new proposal, they'd send us back to do some more work, we'd come back and sort of eventually the court, which, and this, this may even be unique on Israeli standards, but our court, our Supreme Court, takes a very active role in shaping the way the IDF behaves. So that's the second important reason why international law is so applicable to Israel's security operations. The third reason, and here I'm sort of crossing from law into other areas of, of, of international affairs, is that you'll all, you'll all know that increasing efforts are being made in recent years to call the legality of Israel's security operations into question before a sordid international legal fora. And these obviously include the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, other international legal institutions, and also the domestic courts of different states, mostly in Europe, that have legislation that allows them to examine you know, alleged violations of, of international law by other states. And you'll all have heard of attempts to drag Israeli troops into European courts and have them branded as war criminals. Similar attempts were made in connection with US officials and, and, and troops. And those attempts have, have sort of collectively been referred to 
in some circles as lawfare, a combination of law and warfare, or the use of law as a means of warfare. Now, I personally don't like that term. I think it's a little over-aggressive. But the, it embodies the fact that attempts are being made on the international legal arena to internationalize the, the legal debate over Israel's operations and, and, and to create a legal examination in, on the international arena of the legality of Israel's actions. And obviously, that those attempts, despite Israel's consistent objection to the adjudication of its affairs by the international community, those attempts make Israel very cognizant of the fact that the legality of its operations will be reviewed by the international community and by international legal fora. So again, these sort of external forces have compelled the IDF to internalize the importance and the relevance of international law to our operations. And, and I think, to, to sort of paraphrase something which one of our chief of staff, chiefs of staff once said, is that a, a, apart from fighting on the traditional battlefield, the IDF very often finds itself fighting on less conventional fronts, including the legitimacy front. Now, the legitimacy front should never be confused with the legality front. Those are two different issues. But, but the law obviously plays a role in that context of the IDF finding itself in a position where it has to defend the legal validity of its actions on the international arena. And, 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 and here, the involvement of the IDF's legal advisors becomes very pertinent, because one of our obligations is to help the IDF ensure that our actions are always consistent with international law, and that in those cases where international law has been violated, the appropriate investigation and enforcement mechanisms will be upheld. In the Ajuri ruling, which some of you are holding in your hand, the former Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court, Professor Aharon Barak, some of you may be familiar with, noted that international law applicable to situations of armed conflict surely did not envision an adversary as monstrous as today's terrorist organization, and therefore they were not designed to address such an enemy. Nevertheless, he noted that Israel's war against terrorism must take place within the confines of the law. And he referred to another landmark decision where he paraphrased the known idiom that democracies wage war with one hand tied behind their backs, but adherence to the law means they will always have the upper hand. And that quote from Ajuri takes me to the heart of my presentation today, which is to talk about the role international law has, the, the practical role international law has in shaping the way Israel fights Palestinian terrorism and, and other forms of terrorism in, in the Middle East. And, and, and I'll try to look at this from the broader perspective of the way the Western world has been engaged in counterterrorism um, in, in recent years. And I venture to say that the most central issue that we've dealt with in the IDF in the last 10 years, the most central legal question we've had to ask ourselves is what is the applicable legal framework for counterterrorism operations. And, and, and as, as lawyers, you'll, you'll appreciate that you know, before you can engage in a legal debate or a legal conversation or a legal examination, the, the, the most basic question is, what is the normative framework that we're operating within? And what, is the, what are the applicable legal norms? And the reason this question is a bit tricky in the context of counterterrorism is that traditionally, international law viewed terrorism as a form of criminal behavior. And, and therefore, it applied the general laws of criminal law enforcement to counterterrorism. And that was an appropriate response when terrorism was sort of a pinpointed, isolated phenomenon. And, and obviously, when you have a sort of lone terrorist or an isolated event, you can deal with that using criminal law enforcement mechanisms. However, you'd all agree that when terrorism expands in volume and in intensity, to the point where the campaign against terrorism resembles a war more than it does police work, that applying criminal law enforcement tools to counterterrorism is, is, is clearly legally inappropriate. And you'd all agree that, I mean, an attempt to assess, going back to the US, an attempt to assess the war against Al Qaeda in Afghanistan using criminal, the, the framework of criminal law enforcement would be ridiculous, and, and, and that an attempt or a requirement that the US conduct its operations against Al Qaeda in the framework of criminal law enforcement uh, norms 
would be inappropriate. And, and indeed, international law always applies as a function of the factual situation. And, and therefore, the biggest question for us as lawyers was, now that the facts have changed and the situation is different and terrorism has taken a different shape, how does international law respond to that? And how does international law, how does the applicable framework within international law change to address the changing nature of the threat? And the conclusion that we reached in the IDF back in, in early, the early 2000s when we were faced with the, the hus growing hostilities in, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip was that when terrorism rises above the threshold of criminal behavior into the realm of full-fledged military hostilities, when counterterrorism operations are no longer enforcement measures, but they become a full-fledged military campaign, international law responds to that by applying the legal framework that's applicable to international military campaigns, which are the laws of armed conflict or international humanitarian law, as it's referred to sometimes. And Israel's argument was that despite the formal, the, the, the lack of a formal war, because war can only be waged between two states, and therefore when, when states go to war against terrorism, they can't define that as a war. But despite that formalistic shortcoming, the legal framework applicable to such hostilities should be the laws of war, or the laws of armed conflict. And we dubbed that situation in a term that's sort of been circulated in the international legal community as an armed conflict short of war. That was the terminology that we used. And um, originally, back in 2000, that was revolutionary um, for international lawyers. And, and, and international lawyers had a very hard time sort of getting their minds around the fact that the international laws of war could apply to a situation that wasn't legally <coughs> Unfortunately, the, the biggest catalyst for that change being accepted were the 9-11 attacks. And the fact that suddenly the Western world found, and, and not only the 9-11 attacks, but also the, the July attacks 2003 in London and the attacks in Madrid, and the fact that the Western world found itself under attack by organized, powerful terrorist organizations who were capable of waging a full-fledged campaign against uh, an army, that helped Western legal experts internalize the fact that when a factual situation rises above the threshold of an armed conflict and is a full-fledged armed conflict, international law can't be blind to that and has to respond to that by applying the norms that are applicable to armed conflicts. And that was the position that Israel presented to our Supreme Court and was accepted by our Supreme Court, among other decisions in the jury decision you're holding, um, you're holding with you. And that, of course, raises the, it raises two questions. The first question is, does the application of the laws of armed conflict mean that all other legal frameworks are irrelevant? And Israel took the, the position that the answer to that is in the negative. And therefore, Israel continued to apply other relevant legal frameworks, such as the laws of belligerent occupation, which continue to apply in those parts of the occupied Palestinian territories that Israel controlled, or international human rights law, when those were applicable, or Internet or, or just criminal law enforcement whenever that was possible. So there were several different legal frameworks that applied in tandem, and that was a complicated point for us to get our heads around, but eventually we figured out how that, how that works. And more importantly, it, it meant that for us as legal advisors, we constantly had to examine the context that we were operating in and apply the appropriate laws to the appropriate context. The second, more complicated question we had to deal with was, with was which laws of armed conflict apply. And anybody who's done you know, laws of war 101 will recall that international law has different, defined several different types of armed conflicts. And the question then came up, is counterterrorism an international armed conflict? Is it a non-international armed conflict? So is it the first protocol or the second protocol from you know, the additional protocols of 1977? Is it a new type? of armed conflict. Some, some writers have proposed the term extraterritorial armed conflict as a sort of new invention. And, and, and clearly the question was, given the fact that the adversary is not an independent state, can that be an international armed conflict? And does the fact that it happens across international boundaries, does that have an impact 
on, on what law applies. And, and we could probably spend some time talking about the, the, the sort of ins and outs of that. But um, the bottom line is, from Israel's perspective, that rather than embroil ourselves in the legal debate over whether it was an international or non-international armed conflict, what Israel chose to do was to apply or to argue that the applicable law is the most comprehensive and well-developed of all those systems, which is the law of international armed conflict. Um, and, and sort of grossly, grossly speaking, the law as it's embodied in the first additional protocol and in the, the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Conventions, and so on and so forth. And so Israel's, the position Israel took was that to the extent that international counterterrorism operations are conducted across international boundaries, the applicable law is the international law of armed conflict and not the non-international law of armed conflict. Now this is an important point to make because those of you who, who are familiar with the, sort of the, the nuances will appreciate that the laws of non-international armed conflict were aimed at dealing with internal insurgencies in cases where groups within the jurisdiction were challenging the sovereignty or, or the territorial integrity of the jurisdiction. And obviously, that results in an entirely different application of international law, because international law doesn't generally govern what happens within a country's territory. Um, so non the laws of non-international armed conflict clearly are not developed to the point that they can address the complex legal questions of a cross-boundary uh, you know, armed campaign against terrorism. And therefore, it was our position that the more appropriate legal framework and that the framework that would provide more comprehensive responses to the challenges of counterterrorism operations was the framework of the international laws, uh, or the laws of international armed conflict. And again, that was the position we presented to our Supreme Court. And without making a, a determinative ruling on the fact, the court pretty much went along with us by applying the principles of the laws of international armed conflict to Israel's counterterrorism operations. Unfortunately, what I, despite the fact that what I just said now may, to some of you, seem benign or, or obvious, it, it's, it's, it's an issue the international legal community is still grappling with. And, and from a legal perspective, what I've just said, applying the international laws of armed conflict to a non, to a, an armed campaign against a non-state entity, that's a legal revolution. It's something that international lawyers 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago would never have envisioned. And in fact, so much so that when the International Court of Justice examined the legality of Israel's security barrier in the West Bank, it completely overlooked international humanitarian law. It examined the issue through the perspective of the laws of occupation, international human rights law, and it didn't apply the laws of international armed conflict at all. And, and many legal writers have commented on the fact that the sort of skewed result of the ICJ advisory opinion was in part a, a result of the fact that the court simply applied the wrong legal framework. But I bring this example to demonstrate the fact that the international legal community is taking some time to respond to the changing nature of terrorism, the changing nature of the campaign against non-state entities, and that as a result of that, the legal debate is always sort of a step behind the, the factual situation, and, and certainly in the international view, that's the case. But Israel has been very advanced in developing this new theory or the new, the new um, conceptual understanding of, of the, le the legal aspects of counterterrorism. And one of the issues was um, really arguing for the applicability of the laws of international armed conflict <coughs> to that situation. And that brings me to deal with an issue I'm sure you're all familiar with, and I think it was on the poster for today's presentation. So, um, and that's the issue of asymmetric or asymmetrical warfare. I never know whether it's asymmetric or asymmetrical. Um, but the, the, the issue of the imbalance that countries face when dealing with terrorist organizations or with terrorist threats. And typically, the, the term asymmetrical warfare refers to a practical imbalance, to the fact that Militaries have a certain type of mechanisms and tools and equipment and, and, and modus operandi. And terrorist organizations operate in a different way. And they have different capacities. And that creates an asymmetry between terrorists and, and the military. But in the context that I'd like to speak about today, asymmetrical warfare really stems from the fact that 
in counter-terrorist operations, one party to the conflict is bound by international law and sees itself as required to uphold international law, while the other side of the conflict sees itself as free of any legal obligations and, and free to conduct its operations in violation of international law. Beyond that, the, what characterizes asymmetrical warfare is the fact that terrorist organizations use violations of international law and their lack of commitment to international law to achieve both a practical, tactical advantage and a strategic advantage on the battlefield. The tactical advantage is a, is, is a simple point, and, and obviously, if you can conduct your operations without subjecting yourself to legal requirements, that's a lot easier. If you don't have to wear a uniform that distinguishes you from the civilian population, so you can move freely amongst the civilian population. If you conduct your, your, your attacks from within a schoolyard or a mosque or, or a civilian home, um, you know, and so on and so forth. If you attack, if you intentionally target civilians, um, which is prohibited under international law, then of course it's much easier tactically to fight and, and, and terrorist organizations use their lack of inherent commitment to international law to gain a tactical advantage on the battlefield. But more interestingly, I think, um, what we've seen is that asymmetrical warfare is characterized by the fact that terrorist organizations utilize or, or sort of take a trip on the adversary's commitment to international law to gain a strategic advantage. And I'll tell you, I'll start trying to demonstrate what I mean. If a terrorist organization fires a rocket from a schoolyard and the adversary wants to attack, to respond to that attack by firing back, if they refrain from attacking because it's a schoolyard, then the terrorists have won, right? They've, they've attacked with impunity. If, on the other hand, the, the army responds and fires back, and God, <coughs> you know, if there's collateral damage or, or there's damage to the, to the school and so on and so forth, again, the terrorists have won because they can represent the adversary as being a war criminal. So the fact that terrorist organizations conduct their operations in violation of international law, but expect the adversary to uphold international law or, or to be held accountable under international law, grants them a strategic advantage on the battlefield. And I think that's, in, the, in, in legal terms, I think that, that manifests or represents the asymmetry of counterterrorism operations. Which means that for a country that, that wants to fight within the law, counterterrorism creates a real legal challenge, which we have to address. And, and I'd like to spend a few words talking about how, how we address that. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to say that the, the dilemma that Israel has had has always been whether when faced with a, a rogue adversary like terrorist organizations, whether our, the appropriate response is to abandon our legal obligations or whether we should continue seeing ourselves as bound by our legal obligations but apply those in a manner that responds to the unique characteristics of counterterrorism. And Israel has, though, though it may seem tempting to just say, well, if, if they don't fight by the law, we're not going to fight by the law. Israel has never taken that approach, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. And we've always seen our challenge as fighting within the law, despite our adversary's lack of commitment to international law. And, and that's a difficult point legally, because you'll all appreciate that international law is, is based on reciprocity. International law presumes that both sides will uphold the same legal obligations. And you'll know that, for example, under international treaty law, if one party to a treaty violates its obligations under a treaty, the other parties can respond to that by similarly violating their obligations under that treaty. And, and you know, taking that to the sort of realm of international humanitarian law, one would think that a legitimate response to violations of armed conflict by the other side would be to violate, you know, in, 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 um, in, in, a, in a symmetrical manner. But Israel hasn't taken that position, though international law does recognize that sort of frame of thought. Um, Israel hasn't taken that, that, um, that position. Rather, we've tried to, to address the challenges 
of fighting within the law despite the fact that um, our adversary doesn't. And we've done that through what our Supreme Court has called a dynamic application of the law, and, and an attempt to apply the principles of the laws of armed conflict to the unique situations presented by counterterrorism. And you'll recall that the four basic principles of international humanitarian law are military necessity, distinction, the distinction between civilians and combatants and between civilian objectives and military objectives, proportionality, and humanity. And I'd like to focus specifically on two of those, distinction and proportionality, and try to demonstrate how Israel has tried to apply those principles to the very unique situation of counterterrorism. Um, and the reason this is very complex is because the war against terrorism, while the laws of armed conflict attempt to create a sort of black and white distinction between civilians and combatants, the war against terrorism is always fought in the gray zone because terrorists intentionally immerse themselves within the civilian population to blur the black and white distinction between civilians and combatants. And so the bit probably the biggest practical challenge is to respond to that, and to sort of conduct black and white warfare in a gray situation. And then to, to make that more complex, the fact that the distinction between terrorists and, and civilians, or combatants and civilians is blurred, means it's much harder to obtain clear information on the battlefield. And, 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 and the fog of war, which characterizes any battlefield, becomes even more foggy when the battlefield is a village or a town or an urban environment. And, and that's the challenge Israel is faced. And obviously, that manifests itself in the most clear manner in what we call the target vetting process, or the process where uh, military targets are selected and modes of attack are, are chosen. And Israeli legal advisors are involved in the target vetting process, it's sort of a circle that starts from the planning process and eventually ends with an attack. And Israel has integrated its legal advisors into that process. And we're called on to answer very complicated legal questions. And sometimes the international law sort of presents the answers on its own. And sometimes you need to be very creative in the way you plan and execute an attack to meet legal requirements. And I'd like to give an, a few examples of, of how we've done that to try to tailor our responses to the unique challenges. And, and one of the me methods we've used is what we call advanced early warning methods, where Israel has basically used leaflets, telephone calls, text messages, emails, um, you know, public announcements to try to create a distinction between the civilian population and combatants, and, and to counter the fact that terrorists immerse themselves within the civilian population. Israel has tried to separate civilians and combatants using the methods I mentioned. And, and, and an example of that was during the Second Lebanon War, where Israel called on the civilian population of southern Lebanon to leave its villages and move north out of the battlefield so that those people who remained in the villages would be predominantly combatants. Now, of course, Israel, this was misrepresented in the public, in the court of public opinion as Israel deporting <coughs> the civilians of southern Lebanon. And that's part of the difficulty we face, is the misinterpretation of what we do. But the purpose of giving those messages was to create a battlefield that would be much less civilian you know, intense. Now, of course, the fact that we did that didn't mean that we could rely on, on those measures and, and assume that the battlefield was clean, you know, was, was civilian free. But obviously, when there are less civilians on the battlefield, it's easier to distinguish civilians and combatants and to more you know, pinpointedly target combatants. The, th the next thing we did was, under the presumption that many civilians would stay in the villages and that there would be people who couldn't evacuate or would choose to stay, we instructed the civilian population to remain indoors. Now, this may seem like a strange, I mean, like a con con contradicting instruction if we told people to leave and then we told people to stay indoors. So we separated that using sort of a, 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 a two-phase approach. But those people who did stay in the villages were encouraged to stay indoors. And what Israel did was, under the presumption that most civilians would choose to stay indoors, and that those people moving around outside would be predominantly combatants, terrorists, who were engaging in attacks against Israel, Israel chose to make use of a type of munition called cluster munitions, which you 
you've all heard of. They're the dirty word of, of modern warfare. And, and the reason cluster munitions presented an opportunity to the idea was because, just, you know, in addition to other characteristics they have, cluster munitions have the advantage of not harming infrastructure. So anybody who's inside a building would be safe when cluster munitions were applied. But anybody who was moving around outside, engaging in warfare against Israel, would be targeted. So by using this specific means of warfare, Israel tried to create a distinction between those civilians who remained in the villages and were instructed to stay inside, and those people who moved around outside and were presumed to be combatants. Now, Israel's use of cluster munitions was broadly branded by the international community as being unlawful. And the reason that was, was because, not because of the fatalities caused by cluster munitions during the war, because those were very, very low, but because of the adverse effect caused by what we call unexploded ordnance, or, or the unexploded remnants of war after the campaign was over. Now, what most people don't know <coughs> is that after the Second Lebanon War, Israel provided the Lebanese army and UNIFIL, the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, with very detailed maps showing the areas where cluster munitions had been deployed and called on the Lebanese authorities to prevent the civilian population from returning to southern Lebanon before the unexploded ordinance had been removed or, or, or treated. Notwithstanding that, Hezbollah saw this as an opportunity and encouraged the civilian population to come back down to southern Lebanon as a sort of reclaiming of sovereignty over southern Lebanon with the, with, with the full knowledge that by doing that, the, the, this, this move would result in civilian casualties and injuries as a result of exposure to unexploded ordnance. So again, this, I think it, this nicely demonstrates how even attempts to comply with international law and to use advanced systems to create compliance with international law can sometimes be thwarted in the public opinion or the public perception by the adversary's lack of commitment to international law and intentional um, violations of international law by the adversary. Other examples of the sort of tailored s solution Israel has, has adopted for counter-terrorist operations include massive use of precision guided munitions for example, and the, the advantage of these, these methods are that they can, again, create a sort of artificial distinction between legitimate military objectives and civilian objectives. And, you know, we'd all agree that if there was a military base somewhere, then that was a legitimate legal target as opposed to the, the city that might be next to it. But what happens when the military base is the 13th floor of a high-rise building and, you know, floors 1 to 12 are civilian homes and 14 to 16 are civilian homes, and, but there's, there's a military headquarters on the 13th floor. Does the whole building become a legitimate military target? And obviously, there would be massive loss of life if the whole building were targeted. And what Israel has done on many occasions is use precision-guided munitions, which can basically hit a particular floor or group of floors while leaving the rest of the building intact. And despite the fact that that costs a lot of money and is very difficult to execute, Israel has done that to try and deliver its counterterrorism efforts to, in a very, very pinpointed manner and create that distinction between civilians and combatants. And again, Israel has very often been accused of sort of carpet bombing or of, of massive destruction of civilian infrastructure. But I think it's, it's interesting that if you look at aerial photos that show you know, Beirut, for example, after the Second Lebanon War, where Israel conducted hundreds of sorties to attack Hezbollah headquarters and organizations. It's interesting to see that you'll find one building reduced to rubble and the building next to it standing intact. Now, if, there was, if the method was carpet bombing, there would be massive destruction all across. There would be no buildings standing. And the fact that Israel delivered its attacks in a pinpointed manner, targeting a specific building or structure and leaving the rest of the buildings intact is testament to the fact that we tried to respond to the unique circumstances of an enemy operating from within the civilian population using advanced military technology. So that's just another example um, of how we try to respond to um, the, those complexities. There are a lot of legal questions that remain unanswered. And perhaps the most 
daunting and perplexing legal debate is over the issue of proportionality. And the rule of proportionality is probably the hardest rule of international law to apply because there is no objective standard for what a proportionate use of force is. And international law frames the rule of proportionality using very general terms. And it says that when conducting an attack against a legitimate military objective, the collateral damage caused by that attack must not be excessive in relation to the military advantage to be gained by the attack. Now, of course, the different elements of that formula are very, very <coughs> difficult to apply. What is, how do you measure whether something is excessive, whether collateral, whether loss of civilian life or, or destruction of civilian objectives is excessive compared to the military advantage? And what is included within the military advantage? Does it include the direct advantage of that specific attack? Does it include the sort of strategic advantage of the overall campaign? Is it measured in a cumulative way or in a isolated manner for every particular attack? There's a lot of legal questions that are unanswered. And international law is very underdeveloped in that field. And part of the um, unique legal questions that come up in the context of counterterrorism operations is how do you calculate collateral damage when it's hard to distinguish civilians and combatants? Who is considered a military objective and is out of the equation? And who's considered collateral damage? And I'll give you an example. Are voluntary human shields, are they collateral damage or are they a military objective? And if they're collateral damage, do they have the same weight in the equation as a you know, innocent bystander who happens to be caused, you know, caught up in crossfire. Those are all questions that international law doesn't have clear answers on. And again, terrorist organizations take advantage of this lack of clarity to abuse international law and to create a public perception that is very critical of um, the adversary who tries to act within international law. So these are just a few examples of the sort of dilemmas that we face. Another difficulty has to do with the fact that international law, and, and if you're interested in reading more about this, you'll, there's a very interesting report by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia examining the legality of NATO attacks. And international law is very clear on the fact that the legality of military operations should always be assessed <coughs> ex ante, before the fact, not ex post, with the benefit of hindsight. And the reason for that is that International law is cognizant of the fact that battlefield decisions are always made with imperfect information, and that what we know after the fact isn't necessarily what was clear to the military commander before the fact. And the threshold that international law sets to, to counter that or to compensate for that is that it requires, a re the, it, it requires us to assess the legality of operations through the perspective of a reasonable military commander with accessibility to all the reasonably available information. And obviously, a decision made under those circumstances um, would be a very different decision to assess than the hindsight uh, perspective of an attack. And unfortunately, most legal discourse about the legality of military operations is conducted with the benefit of hindsight, when, um, you know, when it's clear what has actually happened, not what um, was anticipated. Happen. And again, the rule of proportionality talks about the anticipated collateral damage and the anticipated military advantage, not about the actual outcome of the, of the attack. But often, when conducting a legal examination, it's very tempting to look at what actually resulted rather than what was anticipated to result. And again, that's a challenge that we have to face. Of course, it becomes much more difficult to, to deal with that challenge, given the fact that often battlefield decisions are made based on intelligence or clandestine information, and therefore it's very hard to have an open and, um, and, and, and sort of public debate over the legality, a transparent debate over the legality of operations, given the fact that a lot of the information that was available to decision makers before the fact can't be exposed in the public arena. And again, this is exploited by terrorist organizations to gain an advantage and misrepresent um, military operations. So that's another challenge that Western democracies have. Unfortunately, it, it would seem to me that in responding to these challenges, the international community has on too many occasions taken what is clearly a politically motivated position. And, um, and, and I gave
gave the example before of the International Court of Justice advisory opinion on, on the defense, which had its own shortcomings. And it's hard to accuse the ICJ of being political, but it's clear that the ICJ was being utilized by the Palestinians as a political vehicle to advance, um, or as a vehicle to advance their political aspirations. And, and, and a lot can be said about, about the, the veracity of the proceedings there and the fact that what was clearly a, a, um, a contentious case was being adjudicated through the advisory opinion mechanism, which was clearly inappropriate. But let's leave that aside for a minute and focus on what I think is a clearer example of how the international legal debate over military operations is, is often um, muddled by, by, by uh, politics, which is the Goldstone Report. And I think if you look at the Goldstone Report, I mean, I don't really have to say much more than the fact that Justice Goldstone himself eventually disassociated himself from the findings published under his own name um, as evidence of the fact that despite whatever intentions the, the, the Palestinians or, or the Human Rights Commission had of using the Goldstone Commission to assess the legality of Israel, or the illegality of Israel's operations in the Gaza Strip. That was a missed opportunity, and, and most, most international lawyers don't accept the Goldstone Report as being a, a valid legal assessment of the situation on the ground. And, and, and the Goldstone Commission had a few basic shortcomings, which I think made it incapable of conducting a, a fair an objective uh, legal assessment. One is the fact that they were given a very specific mandate, which wasn't open-ended. The mandate was to examine and investigate the violations of international law by Israel during the, the campaign in the Gaza Strip. So it was clear you know, what they were looking for. Um, and, and the fact that the commission started its work before the hostilities had even ended, and I think any of you would agree that, it, that it's, it's almost unfair to, to start an investigation before the incident is even, is even over, and, and that to conduct real fact-finding while, while the rockets are still flying and, and, and the shells are still being fired is obviously um, not a serious way of conducting an investigation. Not to mention the fact that some of the members of the, the panel had already voiced their opinion on, on the outcome before they began work. But, but leaving all that aside, I think if you read the Goldstone Report, even for the uninformed, uneducated reader, it would seem that the Goldstone Report's strong reliance on the facts as they were presented by Palestinian organizations and, and the ignorance that the, the Goldstone Commission showed through its report to the, the sort of the blatant modus operandi of, of Hamas and, and the, the, the manner in which Hamas violated the laws of war and conducted its operations resulted in the fact that Israel's measures were being misjudged by the commission because the context was lacking. And I think that the biggest weakness of the Goldstone Commission's report is that by ignoring the conduct of Hamas and, and the modus operandi of Hamas and, and ignoring the legal complexities I just spent about an hour talking about, it obviously reached a very skewed perspective on Israel's operations. And, and I think that, that demonstrates very neatly how when assessing the legality of operations on the international legal arena, the context is the most appropriate and the, is the most important element, and that by framing the appropriate context for the debate, a lot of um, consequences follow in, in, in the context of assessing um, the legal validity. And, and fortunately, the Goldstone Report isn't sort of doesn't stand alone in isolation in the international uh, arena, and, and there are examples of cases where the international legal community has been capable of having a positive, constructive engagement with Israel on international law issues, and, and though those are sort of few and far between, they, they do merit um, mentioning it. And one example from, from recent weeks is the Palmer Report, some of you may have heard of, which was the report by the United Nations panel on the flotilla events of May 2010. And I mention that because, interestingly, while Israel typically rejects the findings of these international panels, Israel actually endorsed the Palmer Report. And, and that's an interesting fact, given the fact that the bottom line of the Palmer Report is critical of Israel. And one would have thought that you know, Israel's typical knee-jerk reaction of rejecting any criticism, um, certainly by legal uh, fora, would have meant that Israel would have rejected the Palmer Report, but it didn't, it endorsed it. And I think if you look at the Palmer Report, and, and I encourage you to read it because it makes for fascinating uh, bedtime reading, 
but it reads a lot like a law school essay. And it really, it starts with a very in-depth analysis of the legal framework and the applicable uh, norms. And it goes on to address the facts as presented by Israel and by Turkey through official investigations that those countries conducted. And the fact that the panel waited for Israel and Turkey to present their own findings rather than making you know, their own assessment of the facts, which would obviously have been imperfect, was, was a responsible decision by, by the panel. And then ultimately, the panel applied the legal framework to the facts as they had been presented and made its conclusions. And the conclusions of the Palmer panel were that um, given the applicability of international humanitarian law, which we discussed earlier, Israel's naval blockade on the Gaza Strip was legally valid, that Israel had the, le the legal authority to enforce the blockade, but in, con in contrast, that the actual degree of force used to enforce the blockade was disproportionate, and therefore the loss of life on, on board the Mavi Marmara was, was disproportionate. And again, you'd think Israel would reject a finding like that, given that it's critical of Israel, but Israel has endorsed the report, the Turks by the way, but Israel has endorsed the report. And I think that stands testament to the fact that when Israel is presented with a responsible, objective, balanced, factually sound assessment of its activities, we're willing to, to have a constructive dialogue along that. And, and, and if you sort of go back to the work of the panel, the fact that Israel sent four top civil servant lawyers to represent it before the panel again, is testament to the fact that Israel, when faced with an opportunity to have a professional engagement with the international community on legal issues, Israel embraces that um, opportunity, even if it's an open-ended um, exercise, as, as this was. So I, I bring these two points, the Goldstone Report and the Palmer uh, Report, as, as two opposite examples of how the international community can either have a positive or negative engagement on international law issues, and, and how international law often presents an opportunity, and that the miscarriage of justice, which sometimes occurs on the international legal arena, is really a missed opportunity to have a positive engagement. Um, to summarize this part of my, of my presentation and open it up for questions with the time that we have left, I think it's it's fair from my perspective and my, from my personal perspective to say that international law is very present in Israel's decision-making process. And that regardless of how that's perceived by the international community, is Israel's administration and certainly the IDF remains very deeply committed to upholding international law. I think that personally for us as lawyers, the biggest, the single biggest risk to that commitment our attempts on the international arena to discredit Israel regardless of what it does. And, and, and the sentiment that one could encounter within Israel, within the IDF, is, well, if we're going to be accused of being...